Hi everyone, thanks for coming back to another video. I appreciate y'all coming back. God bless you. I hope you're doing well. And I hope there's peace in your hearts and your homes today. Um, as you can see from the picture on the screen, we are going to delve back into our study with Ireland. Um, because there are some things that the Lord has shown me since I've shared the last information with Ireland. And truly, the Lord has not stopped continuing to point me to Ireland. So, um, so I, let me go ahead and start sharing with you some of the things that he has shown me and then some of the things that he has told me. And then also to um, a book that he has led me to, which is um, uh, a, a book that we're going to be reading out of because there's some great historical foundational information in this book. It's called The Book of Tepe, Queen of Tara, and Gibraltar. So... Um, What's really interesting in regards to this book is um, is a lot of the history that was um, brought forth. Um, Tia herself, Tia Tepe herself, wrote down her journey from Jerusalem to Ireland and um, did a lot of prophecies as well. Um, all of which have come true, uh, have come to pass and come true with the exception of one. Um, and we're going to talk about that one particular prophecy um, that we're still waiting on. So remember when we did those videos on uh, Ireland in the past, um, as a brief recap, um, I went to the coast and I was praying to the Lord, and he said, My name for you this day is O'Hare. Um, I didn't know what it meant. I wasn't sure what he was talking about. I wasn't even sure at first that I heard him correctly, and I asked again. And yes, it was, My name for you this day is O'Hare. Um, and he told me that they were a, a clan. That's what he told me. He said they are a clan. I asked if they were some type of tribe, thinking, you know, the, the tribes of Israel and what have you. And he said clan, which, you know, at first I was like, clan, you know, what are you talking about? And he proceeded to tell me to go look it up. And so, uh, and so we did. And we've done some studies um and some uh sharings of things that we have found and what the lord has said to us um over the years and we delved into uh the tribe of judah and the twins uh, and that is where our studies took us and we went forward from there so I do want to go ahead, uh, for those who have not seen uh, those videos, is to lay um, a historical foundation um, for these Ireland videos because um, there's something very significant that we need to be made aware of and need to know and understand uh, in regards to um, what's going to be happening there in the future, and what has happened there in the past. Um, early on in my walk with the Lord, uh, one particular day he said one word to me. He said the word Bangor, B-A-N-G-O-R. He gave me that word. It was audible. I thought he meant Maine, Bangor, Maine. But that is not what he meant. What he meant was Bangor, Ireland. Um, and we followed the scarlet thread and the red hand all the way to Bangor, Ireland. Um, and so we've, we've shared some of this information before. And if you want to know about what the Lord has said to me and led us through our studies at that point, please go back 
to those uh, two Ireland videos, uh, maybe three. I don't know how many there are, but um, but we're going to be kind of doing some review with those and then starting to build from this again because um, the, it's it's going to play a very important part in history, uh, in our history. Um, and so, um, so let's, let's get started with that. First, this is an image, just a painted image of, uh, Princess Tia Tefi, um, the daughter of Zedekiah, uh, in Jerusalem. Um, notice that she has a shield. She has a trident, a golden trident. Um, she is, uh, sitting around or on the lion, which is the uh, tribe of Judah. Um, and then also she is holding an olive leaf. Now, very interesting with this olive leaf because weren't we just talking about an olive leaf? Weren't, didn't we just do some studies uh, that the Lord had led us to um about my dove being released from my hands and we delved into the olive leaf because of the story of Noah and the dove coming back with an olive leaf. So um, she brought an olive sprig from Jerusalem when she left with prophet Jeremiah. So um, if you're not familiar with the story, we're going to go into a little bit of a, um, a foundational basis uh, in regards to the, the historical part of uh, how she left and why and what was going on and even coming up into uh, to where she was um, so that we have some historical basis and foundation. So let's go ahead and get started on that. Um, I am basically just going to be reading really out of um, this book. And I bought this book, um, I don't know, several months ago. And I knew I had gotten through probably about half of it. And uh, I had to go back because this summer I really didn't delve into it too much. I was reading a little bit, putting it down for a while coming back and reading it for a little bit and putting it down for a while. Um, and it's not because it was boring. It was, it was because I just had so much going on. Um, there's a lot of information in this book, but just like with anything else, uh, not everything is going to be a hundred percent. Not everything is going to be, um, things that you agree with, but it's food for thought grab the nuggets that we need to grab and then we'll move on. So um, so if I happen to mention something while I'm reading through a few of these pages um, that you're not sure about and you know or what have you, just understand that we are wanting to see the historical value of what is going on up to Tia and then her going into Ireland. Now when she kept her own writings and she kept her own writings. Uh, again, the Lord is saying, keep a journal, keep a journal, write things down. Okay, so even she did this, um, and we have it as a historical document. She wrote in rhyme, uh, and um, the author of this book did not write in rhyme. However, all of Tia's writing in this book is written in rhyme. And so it's going to be... Um, it takes a little bit to try and figure out, but this particular book also helps point to some of the older country names as to what it is now, which is the reason why I bought this book, um, because it kind of helps keep things in my mind a little bit straight. Okay, so um, we're just going to get into, um, let's see. Let me just start from the beginning, because this is the story uh, as a brief overview, and we're not going to read it all in today's video. We'll break it up into certain parts, but a lot of the information that we're going to be reading is needed so that we have that 
foundational information. Okay. Um, so let's see. Tia Tepi became the Queen of Ireland on the 21st of June in 583 BC and was later wrongfully deified as a mythical goddess called Bo or Bovenda, which is why over the passage of time she she became lost in the realms of myth and fantasy, ceasing to be remembered as the real flesh and blood queen who came to Ireland from Jerusalem that she really was. She was, like the Irish people, descended from the Jacob who had his name changed by God to Israel at Bethel, where he set up a stone pillar he had used as a pillow that he anointed with oil and also named Bethel, which means the house of God, along with the place where it happened as it is recorded in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Jacob, or Israel, had 12 sons who fathered the 12 tribes of Israel, the fifth of whom was called Dan, and he fathered the Tuatha de Danan, the tribe of Dan, from whom the Irish and, da and Danish people are descended. The 11th of Jacob's 12 sons was called Joseph, to whom Jacob, or Israel, gave the famous coat of many colors. Israel's fourth son, Judah, from whom the Jews claimed descent and who sold his brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt, had twin sons called Zerah and Perez, as it is recorded in the Old Testament of Genesis chapter 38 of the Bible. Okay, so in our last videos, we went through um, what happened with Tamar and Judah and then her having the twins and the birth of, of what happened. When Judah's twins were about to be born, the, the midwife who knew that there were twins in the womb had prepared herself with a scarlet cord to mark the firstborn. Today, the same thing is done with a plastic name tag placed around the baby's wrist. Zerah, meaning scarlet in Hebrew, put his hand out of the womb first and the midwife tied the scarlet cord around the wrist to identify him as the firstborn. Then he pulled his hand back into the womb, and his twin brother, Perez, was born first, therefore breaching his brother Zerah's birthright. And so he was named Perez, which means breach in Hebrew. Contrary to the universally common held belief that all Israelites are Jews, and before anyone jumps to the wrong conclusion that therefore the Danites are Jews, I must explain that the word Jew and the word Israelite are not synonymous and do not mean the same or refer to the same people, no matter what your dictionary may say. They refer to two related but different peoples as any honest and well-informed rabbi would admit, and studying a Bible will confirm. So we, we did a study about this one time that not all Israelites are Jews and not, you know, and vice, and, or vice versa. Um, and so we talked about it as, you know, um, all people that lived in America were Americans, but not all people were, um, you know, peoples of Connecticut or peoples of New York, right? It just depended. Um, so they were Americans, but they were not Connecticut Americans, or they were not New York Americans. Um, so I know that that sounds kind of strange today because we're so mobile and we're, and we're in transit so much that that really doesn't seem like it matters much. But in regards to this, as to who these peoples were, um, it is important. Long before the birth of Tia Tefi, back in 997 BC, under uh, David's grandson uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the 12 tribes of Israel fell out with each other and split up into two separate kingdoms with the two separate kings, and they lived side by side, but in two separate countries called Israel and Judea 
the twelve tribes divided into the ten tribe, tribed house of Israel, who lived in Israel, in the northern section of the Holy Land, under King Je Jeroboam, and the two tribed house of Judah, who lived in Judea, in the south of the Holy Land, under the sovereignty of Solomon's son, King Rehoboam. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and its capital was Samaria. The southern kingdom was called Judea, and its capital was Jerusalem. The tribe of Dan was one of the ten tribes of the northern ten-tribe kingdom called Israel, and those ten tribes are the same tribes who later became the ten lost tribes of Israel. So the Danites are therefore Israelites who are not Jewish. The Jewish people claim their descent from the two-tribed house of Judah, or Judah, hence their name Jew. All true racial Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. Just as, for example, all Scottish people are British, but not all British are Scottish, if that makes sense. Returning now to the story, Ferez, having taken the birthright from his brother Zerah, carried the tribal or the family name of Judah, from which came King David, the shepherd boy who slew the giant Goliath with a stone from his sling and became the king of Israel. The royal line of David descends from Ferez, and their emblem is an amber golden lion, rampant with a crown on its head. The descendants of his brother Zerah of the red hand, because of that scarlet thread, having lost the birthright, went into exile and migrated to Heberia, now known as Iberia, or more commonly, Spain. There they built a city called um, there they built the city of Zaragaza. Zaragaza, originally Zaragaza, means the stronghold of Zara, and the city is still called Zaragaza today, even though the Israelites, traditional enemy Babylon in Rome, invaded. Hiberia and drove the Zarahites out to the northern coastline, coastlands of Spain. From there, many of them fled across the water to Ireland. Some of their descendants migrated from Ireland to Scotland, and then once there decided to use their own Judah Zarah version uh, emblem, which is the red lion rampant just as Judah Ferez used the amber lion, rampant. And rampant is a word that is used that means the animal is standing up uh, on its back legs in a coat of arms. Centuries after Zerah left Judea to go into exile abroad, the ten-tribed house of Israel had been taken out of Israel, the northern kingdom, to Assyria as slaves in 722 BC as punishment for breaking the covenant. Jeremiah, the Bible prophet, was sent to King Zedekiah of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom, who had by then also broken God's covenant, to warn him to return to keeping the covenant, or God would punish the two-tribed house of Judah, as he had previously punished the ten-tribed house of Israel. Jeremiah warned King Zedekiah of Jerusalem that if he did not keep the covenant, God would send King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to lay siege to and destroy Jerusalem. Zedekiah did not like God's message, and so he decided to ignore it and punish God's messenger by putting him in prison. However, that did not prevent the prophecy from being fulfilled 
it only made its fulfillment more certain. Nebuchadnezzar sent his army and laid siege to Jerusalem, whose inhabitants became so hungry that they ate their own children. The city was not only taken, but was also laid waste and burned. God's house, the holy temple on Mount Moriah, that had been built for him by Solomon, was also destroyed along with the city. Nebuchadnezzar, who was sent by God to punish Zedekiah and the two tribe house of Judah, just as the Assyrians had used in 722 BC to punish the ten tribe house of Israel, honored Jeremiah as God's prophet, released him from prison, and gave him free reign to do as he was commanded by God. Now there's favor. Zedekiah, who was descended from the royal line of David, of the Perez branch of the tribe of Judah, and all his sons were captured and taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, where his sons were slain in front of Zedekiah's eyes, and then he was blinded, so that execution of his sons would be the last thing he ever saw. That's pretty cruel. He himself died in prison in Babylon, and all of this was because he betrayed God and his people, broke the covenant, and caused his people to suffer poverty under his own laws, instead of prosperity under God's laws in the covenant that was written in the Torah. The Torah is the collective name for the five books given to Israel through Moses, in Sinai, and it means the law. The inhabitants of Judea were also taken captive and were removed, to, removed from Judea into Babylon to become slaves to their captors as punishment for allowing themselves to be misled by their rulers. Just as the ten tribe house of Israel had pre previously been punished, and taken off their land, Israel, into slavery before them. The house of Israel were taken to Assyria in 722 BC, where they were never returned home to Israel. The house of Israel and the house of Judah were both punished for the same reason, that is, they broke the covenant and allowed their rulers to make up their own poverty-creating selfish laws economic policies and taxes in contravention of God's commandments and political warnings to his people, prophetical warnings to his people. At the time Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, the Assyrians were no longer the world superpower that had defeated the ten tribe house of Israel and had themselves been defeated and driven out of Assyria so they were no longer in a position to keep the ten tribe house of Israel as slaves, and they all migrated to the northwest of the Holy Land. The, the Assyrians stopped in what is now called Germany and eventually became the Germans of today, with their German military cross that is identical to the ancient Assyrian Knight's Cross. The ten tribe house of Israel had been slaves in Assyria since 722 BC and therefore had learned to speak Assyrian, which is why there are Assyrian or Germanic words in the English and other Northern European languages today. They also lost their Sabbath sign that told them who they were, having changed their Sabbath day from the true Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, Saturday, to the Assyrian and Babylonian sun worship religions worship day of Sunday, and so had begun to lose their true history, Mosaic laws and the Torah, and also their identity as Israelites. So here in America, the churches are open um, and, and people go to church on Sunday for the most part. Um, I believe the Catholic Church still offers a Saturday night, um, Saturday evening or afternoon, uh, worship or whatever they call it. Um, 
And I know that the Jewish people follow that Saturday is the day of rest, which would be the seventh day. So it's very interesting that there is confusion in regards to a day of rest and a day of worship um, across the world. Uh, originally, it was a Saturday. Um, we, we understand how um, the Jewish people have been counting um, and, and how they follow their calendar. Um, and, and even there's even some confusion with some of that, too as far as timing and how many days are in the month and you know all of all of that so i think it's very interesting but it is something to keep in mind uh that if you're not to work and you're not to you know to to that is the true day of rest um that that needs to be a saturday um you know i do all of my housework and everything on saturday i don't think working uh, I, I don't know really what the definition of not working is. Is it not cooking? Is it not cleaning? Is it, you know, what, what is it and what does it mean? And do I really need to switch and start doing all of my work on Sunday? Um, I'm going to be seeking the Lord on that because I truly want to honor the Sabbath. Um, so please take that to the Lord and um, ask him about that. Let's continue on. So finally free from the domination by the Assyrians, most of the house of Israel separated themselves from them and continued on their long trek to the northwest coastlands and islands of what is now Europe, exactly as it was prophesied that they would do. During the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon's troops in 588 B.C., Jeremiah hid with Zedekiah's daughter, Tia Tepthi, under the temple, under the temple built by Solomon in a cave where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden along with Jacob's pillar, the Beth, what they call the Bethel um, or the, the Leophel stone, which is King David's throne of Israel. Okay, so Solomon's temple, under the temple was a cave where they housed the Ark of the Covenant, um, Jacob's pillar, uh, what they call the Bethel. Remember, he, he named it the Bethel. The, he, and then the other name associated with that is the Leah Fail Stone. And then another name associated with that is King David's throne of Israel. So I want to show you a picture of this because when I saw this and then did some study on it online and then went to where they say the Leah Fail Stone is in Ireland, uh, I want to bring something up to you. Notice here, this is the stone right here. It looks like a seat almost, doesn't it? Um, so Jacob's pillar. Now, we did some studies in the past that this particular stone is also called the coronation stone, which is the stone that is supposed to be underneath uh, any you're supposed to be on this stone, sitting on it, standing on it, what, however it, it needs to be done uh, to, to, to become a king uh, or queen. And so um, it, it, in, the, uh, in uh, England, where they have that big coronation chair, they're supposed to be some type of stone this stone under it so that this particular uh, king or queen can uh, actually rule it is a it's a coronation stone so I want to I want to pull up a couple of things and let me just mark my place where I'm at because I want to show you something uh, so uh, this is going to be very very interesting 
So notice here um, for Queen Elizabeth, she's sitting on this uh, particular chair and this is her, her coronation as becoming queen. But what I want to show you is kind of what the chair looks like um, with the stone in it. Um, and let's, I, I don't know if it's the actual stone. Um, I have some ideas that it's uh, possibly not. Um, but this is the chair and the stone is there. Um, let's see, is this... So this is the chair without the stone. Um, and let's see if we can see it with the stone. There, with the stone. So the particular stone that we're looking at is a flat stone. It appears to be uh, like a seat. But again, uh, looks like it's got some handles here. Um, but it appears to be a, a square. Um, so very interesting here, but I, I did want to show this to you. So this was all under Solomon's temple, um, and, and it's very interesting to, uh, to think about. So let's continue on. So when you type in Leah Fail, uh, for Ireland, where it me is meaning here Stone of Destiny, which is supposed to be the, the stone we just saw, um, it says here that this is the coronation stone for the High Kings of Ireland, which we understand because um, that would have come with her. But look at the images that are there. Uh, this says the legendary Leah Fail, a roaring rock for the coronation of ancient Irish. Um, I, I need to pull this up because I need for you to see exactly what they're saying the coronation stone is. Now guys, I don't know about you, but uh, this is not a square. This is a, uh, uh, what what appears to be called a, a, a phallic type of uh, image, structure, molding of a stone. Um, it is definitely not the coronation stone uh, that is placed under uh, all kings and queens to uh, to rule. So um, what's this all about then, right? So um, in the book that I am reading, um, it does go into what that's all about, which was really interesting. So what you're seeing, what they're saying, is the coronation stone, is not the coronation stone. It is not the Leothal. Um, it is something that was placed there. Um, we'll get into it. Let's continue reading. So we talked about the stone of destiny, right? We talked about Jacob's pillar, Bethel, right? So the Ark of the Covenant that was underneath Solomon's temple also is that special gold-covered box inside which are kept the five books of the Torah, or the law, and the stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written that were given to Moses in Sinai for all of Israel, okay? Not just Jewish Israel, all of Israel. Barak, Jeremiah's scribe or his secretary, then came and told them that the coast was clear. Remember, Jeremiah and Tia were hiding in that cave with all of these things underneath the temple because Nebuchadnezzar was still seizing the city. So Barak came and told them that the coast was clear, and Jeremiah took Tia and, and God's treasures and went first to Mitzpah and then to Tafanes, or what they call Tanis, in Egypt for safety. They stayed in the palace that was given to Tia Tepi 
by Pharaoh Hophra after he adopted her as his own daughter. Now, how interesting is that? The Pharaoh adopted her as his own daughter. This happened several times with her, and I don't really know what that's all about, but I find it very interesting, and I'd kind of like to know a little bit more about that. Was that for her own safety uh, and protection, or was that an agreement that was done with the world, you know, the, the country's rulers at the time, or what? I don't know, but it happened another time, too, that we'll, we'll learn about, but I think that's very interesting. So... Um, they stayed in a palace that was given uh, to Tia by the pharaoh after he adopted her as his own daughter. Daughter, The palace, although now in ruins, talking about today, the Tel Defna is still today uh, known as the palace of the daughter of Judah, just as she prophesied in her book that it would be. So remember, she's got a lot of prophecies as well. The royal party stayed at Tanis for some time until Jeremiah was warned by God that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was also being sent by him to invade Egypt and that they must leave taking the ark, taking the ark to God's predestined place of safety. Jeremiah's group left Tanis on a moonless cloudy night sailing in a ship of Tyre piloted by a Danite called Bucky, son of Helic, who was accompanied by his son, Bodan, firstly to Carthage, where they arrived three weeks later, but did not disembark. At sunset in Carthage, a strong hot wind blew, um, let's see, a strong hot wind lost my place by that thing that came up. Hang on one second. I'm going to close out my email that seems to be shooting stuff. At sunset in Carthage, a strong hot wind blew off from the desert, driving them north for seven days and tearing their sails. On the seventh day, they entered a little bay by the mouth of an unknown river that ran east to west where they dropped anchor. So talk about the Lord truly getting them where they need to be by the hand of God, truly. Um, so drawing lots to see who would go ashore to find out where they were, the lot fell upon uh, Bodan, the pilot's son, who rode ashore in their skiff. Bodan captured a local and brought him aboard the ship so that uh, Bucky, the pilot, who spoke all languages, could ask him where they were. They found out from him that they were in the Tiber estuary, and he advised them to avoid Rome, both then and throughout the future. Jeremiah made many prophecies about Rome, including the Roman crucifixion of Jesus. And on up to our day. From there they sailed on to Corsica and Sardinia, where Jeremiah prophesied that in the later days, Napoleon would unsuccessfully attack Russia. Jeremiah's group soon arrived at Gibraltar, the gate, the rock with the lion's shape. There, Tia Tepfi was proclaimed queen by a Gadite, Israelites who had settled there, and the rock itself even cried out her name, itself acknowledging her as its queen. The rock cried out. Uh, can you imagine? So she was queen of Ireland, but she was also queen of Gibraltar. So when I was first reading this, I thought, well, what is so special about Gibraltar? I mean, we never hear about Gibraltar. So, I mean... We know about Gibraltar. We've heard about it. We know from history, you know, uh, back in school and what have you, that there is a Gibraltar. But wh why was she queen of Gibraltar and Ireland? Uh, that didn't make sense to, me, sense to me. So I was wondering, what's so special about Gibraltar? I've never really heard, really, uh, anything, you know, in my studies about Gibraltar. So... Uh, let's continue reading. 
So the rock itself even cried out her name, acknowledging her as its queen. Tia found many of the inhabitants worshipping Melkarth, or who they call Neptune, and condemned them for their idolatry. There was an idol of Neptune at a shrine to him, and the idol had a golden trident in its right hand. When Elyar, the ruler of Gibraltar, ordered to be taken from the idol and given to Tia, to go with the olive sprig, she had brought with her from Jerusalem. During, during a struggle with the priest to remove the trident, the idol was smashed in two. So now, um, Gibraltar, the island that is said to have a lion's shape. And I wondered, well, uh, what, what, What's going on in Gibraltar? You know, um, something don't, you know, I, I started looking things up. And I want to show you something because um, when I saw this, uh, especially after what the Lord um, has spoken to me about and took me in places and told me certain things, I want to... I want to show you something because when I went in and started looking at Gibraltar, well, what is Gibraltar? What, what, what does, if someone was going to go to Gibraltar, why would they go to Gibraltar? I mean, what's the draw? Is it a tourism? Is there, is there some historical value? What's, what's going on over there? Because, um, I didn't, I didn't know anything about Gibraltar. I want to show you something. So one of the biggest things that is going on um, with Gibraltar is St. Michael's Cave. Um, it is a network of limestone caves located um, uh, what they call the Rock of Gibraltar, this lion-shaped uh, rock island I guess um, and I thought it was really really interesting to start going and looking at it and then when I started looking at the pictures of it guys take a look at this now what's really interesting is this is a cave that has those rocks hanging down this is this is a very interesting formation of rocks and caves and what have you. I mean, the 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 pictures. Um, I I couldn't believe, but I when I saw this, I was like, wait a minute. You know, about a week before I did this study. The Lord took me in the spirit to that grotto. Now, I told y'all I was going through a cave and tunnels. It was dark. It was damp. These rocks were hanging from the, from the ceiling down. They were coming down. And then all of a sudden, I'm reading in this book a week, 10 days later, and it, it talks about Gibraltar. And I'm like, well, what's going on in Gibraltar? So the Lord had to have given me that instinct to go and look and to search it out because now I find this. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I mean, what? So when I see the word St. Michael, I'm thinking... You know, is this Catholic where they saint, you know, they give people sainthood or, or what is this? And this turns out to be that this is the Archangel Michael's cave. So this is somewhere that he appeared. So it says here, this is where Archangel, Archangel Michael is said to have appeared. And so they, they have this here. So now, this says that this 
uh, has more than 150 caves uh, within this uh, rock of Gibraltar. Um, and I thought that to be very interesting. So I went through and I was looking at the, um, oh, this is what they call them, stalagmites and stalactites, whatever these uh, rock deposits are coming down. Um, but it's, it talks about the history and it talks about all different kinds of things as I was going through. Um, take a look at that. St. Michael's Cave in 1830. This is an engraving. Wow. That is just amazing. So I'm going down here and I get to this part. Um, in 1942, it was decided that an alternate entrance was required to improve air circulation within the emergency hospital in the lower chambers of the cave, as well as to serve as an emergency exit in case of airstrike. While blasting the rock in order to create an extra opening, another deeper system of caves known as New St. Michael's Caves, sometimes referred to as Lower St. Michael's Cave, were discovered. A series of descending chambers are riddled with examples of almost all known cave formations, including an underground lake of crystal clear water. When I told you all about the grotto, I said it was rocks going around and we were looking down into the water. Uh, when I read that, I almost fell out of my chair. And I said, did the Lord just take me to this place before I found something in my studies? Um, I, I have not gotten confirmation of that. Um, but God, what, what are the odds? What are the odds that he takes me into the spirit he gives me a place of rest or restoration where I need to go. This is where the hospital is. This is where that grotto was. This is where they found a water of crystal clear, an area of crystal clear water. Listen, you cannot make this stuff up. There is absolutely no way. There's no possible way. Uh, for any of the circumstances to be laid out as accurately and uh, in sync as it has been. So um, I, I want to stop there with the sharing because, um, and, and there's so much more, things that the Lord has told me, but I can't share that part until we get to that part because um, it, it needs to make sense to you, um, it, and, and it needs to connect the dots as to what he has told us in the past. Um, this is just absolutely amazing. Um, so here's Jeremiah and Tia and Barak and the Ark of the Covenant, the Bethel Stone, and several other things that we're going to get into uh, later. Um, but that all went with them. It did not stay in Jerusalem. It did not. Um, if it is still there, then my question is going to be raised. Do you all remember that man that said he found the Ark of the Covenant? So now my question is going to be raised. If, if this is still hidden in Ireland, then what did he stumble upon? A forgery? Um, guys, there's, there's mystery to it. There's intrigue. There's like, oh my goodness, it's a, it's a page turner. I'm telling you, this book 
is a page turner. If you have time, try to see if you can um, order this book. Um, you can find you can find a lot of it online. So um, so if you want to go online and look, that would be free. Um, I don't know what I paid for this book. Let me see. Uh, a lot of times I use the receipt as a. Oh, I don't. It doesn't have a price on it. Um, yeah, I bought it in. Uh, they shipped it to me in April. So see, I really haven't had it that long. Um, but guys, I'm telling you, it is. It's a page turner in the in the history and the information that's coming out is phenomenal. Um, Jeremiah provided prophecy the whole time. Tia provided prophecy the whole time. They wrote things down. Jeremiah's scribe was writing things down, and then Jeremiah, once he died, um, and, and Tia was writing things down. Please keep up with your journals. Write, write your stuff down, guys. I'm telling you, the, the, the information that you can share is going to be specific to a particular person and God will get that in the hands of who it needs to be in the hands of. Um, so guys, we're going to come back again. We're going to continue on with this uh, Ireland study unless the Lord wants me to um, share something in between, uh, in, in which I will. But, um, but guys, there's so much here. You guys are going to flip out. It is amazing. It is just amazing uh, what, what the Lord God can do for us uh, and for everyone. Um, it's going to open a lot of people's eyes, I believe. And uh, it opened mine. I was like, oh, my goodness. Um, and the Lord has been pointing us to it all this time. He's been pointing it, and, and I'm going to bring up a couple of things and remind you all of a couple of videos we've done in the past where he was pointing to certain things um, already. And so, um, and so, anyway, I just wanted to go ahead and share uh, that part with you uh, today. I apologize, this video is a little bit longer. Um, there's a lot of information to talk about in regards to this, so uh, hang tight, guys. Uh, but that Leah Fail that's in Ireland, it is not the coronation stone. It is not. And once you all find out what it is and, and why it's there, you won't freak out. All right. I love you all. Thanks for coming back to another video. Uh, stay safe in what you're doing. Um, I know the kids are probably uh, back in school or getting ready to go back in school. My grandson started today. Um, so maybe a little bit of, uh, extra peace in your house, <laughs> uh, somewhere along the line. God bless you all. Stay safe till we meet again.